Once information is stored in HDFS, it has to be processed, and Hadoop at its base level uses MapReduce to do that. So again, our basic Hadoop processing architecture, below the dotted line we have HDFS, which is data storage, and above that we have MapReduce, which is data processing. And what we'll see that's a little bit different than we're used to in a SQL environment is that the processing and the storage is actually being done by the same nodes. So we don't have storage nodes and processing nodes. We just have nodes that do both, which has some very important performance implications. A fundamental attribute of distributed query processing in Hadoop is taking the query to the data. So this is a little bit different than in SQL. In SQL, we're used to having an SMP server that has SQL Server running on it, and our data might be distributed out into a SAN somewhere across the network. And when the server wants to process that data, it tells the SAN, send the data over to me, and it processes that data, and then you know essentially throws out uh, all of the details that it got in order to produce the summary results of the query. MapReduce works quite a bit differently. In MapReduce, the query itself, which in this example is a JavaScript mapping program, is actually distributed out to each of the HDFS servers. So that HDFS server isn't just a file storage server, it also can run programs to analyze the files that it's storing. And it's an important benefit of this kind of a system that we can take the query to the data, because then we don't have to move the data from where it exists into a different server in order to be analyzed, only to be discarded. So to revisit the schema on read, Again, we load the data, so let's say that we bring in a lot of customer file data and put it into the cluster and it gets distributed. So when we query the data and send in this mapper program, customer-mapper.py, it's actually going to take that code and send that out to all the nodes that have the data that needs to be analyzed and let them do the analysis on the data that's stored locally within that node. And what does a map program look like? Well, this is an example of one that's written in Python, which Python is a scripting language that I think is, is fairly easy to follow and you could probably work out what this is doing. And this isn't the only kind of mapping program. Many are in Java, many do different things, but this one is fairly simple. What it's doing is it's reading the file that it's given line by line, it's splitting it up, looking at the words, and then reporting back every word that it finds and it's returning the number one, which will be summarized later. But it's a fairly simple operation and if you could think of this happening on a massive scale if you had a million files and you had a hundred nodes and each of them was doing this independently and not having to move those files from where it's stored to some processing node you can you can kind of imagine the advantages that you get in that kind of processing but still it's only producing a file or output that is related to the data that it has it needs to be summarized somewhere else and that's what a reducing program does so if you think of a hundred nodes generating a map file the reduce file combines those together and summarizes the results. This one's a little bit more complicated, but again, it's just a script. We'll look at these in more detail uh, in future lessons. But think of it map program, reduce program, map being run by 100 nodes, maybe reduce being run by one node to combine the output of the 100. Now, it's a little bit more complicated than that. There, there actually are intermediate uh, steps that might occur, but fundamentally, that's what MapReduce is all about. So as data warehouse people looking at Python scripts and wondering why are we doing this again, let's just revisit that. And there are some good reasons. One is that in this processing paradigm we have a virtually unlimited storage cap. We're not going to run out of drive bays in our server. We're not going to run out of slots in our SAN. Um, we really don't have that same kind of issue that we do in an SMP or highly verticalized system. Also we can get expandability at low cost. This is an MPP system, so if we want to store twice as much data and process twice as much data, we just need to purchase twice as many nodes. We don't need to change to a more expensive type of technology. We just add more. And this was an advantage building a search engine. It can also be an advantage in data processing. And that expandability is generally going to be linear in terms of economics and performance. A 16-node Hadoop cluster can store about twice as much as an 8-node cluster and can process about twice as much in the same amount of time. It's a very linear equation. We also get the benefits of bringing the processing to the data. It's not efficient to transfer data through systems in order that it can be processed by another node. So the MapReduce paradigm actually moves the processing to the data. We also get schema on read flexibility. 
In this kind of a paradigm, we can change how we look at the data. We can change our minds about what that schema means to us in terms of the attributes it has. We can also adapt to schema that's changing over time by adjusting our map programs to accommodate those changes rather than having to change a schema and reload all the data. And then finally, and maybe most importantly, we can handle the non-traditional kind of loosely structured data that we haven't really been able to put into our relational schemas before. And I'll close with this table from Tom White's Hadoop, the Definitive Guide, where he compares the traditional relational system to MapReduce. And we've talked about a number of these differences, like the data size limitations or expandability, uh, data integrity structure, and so on. And I think the important point of the table is really not to look at MapReduce as a replacement for a traditional relational or vice versa. Each system is potentially good at different things, and we just have to decide where to apply this technology within our overall strategy. So with that, we've looked at the very basic and core parts of Hadoop, the distributed file system and the job scheduling system on top of that called MapReduce. And next, we'll get into some of the more applied pieces that we would use in a data warehouse environment with Hive and Scoop and start to look at some examples of these technologies in action.